would love one hour with you. I'm thinking of the same thing as you. Then why delay? Just one reason. What's the reason? It's my wife. Hello and welcome to Season 4 of How Would Lubitsch Do It? A podcast in which we discuss the works of director Ernst Lubitsch, one film at a time. It's 1932, and Matt Severson joins us to discuss One Hour With You. Come visit ErnstCast.com if you'd like show notes, resources as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing, a link to our Discord, or just to say hi. Welcome back, Matt, to our show. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I am so excited about our topic today. If anyone remembers, Matt Severson, who you might remember from such episodes as The Merry Jail, is back, and we are in person here at the library he runs. (laughs) Before we start, can you tell us a little bit about the building we're in? What's its story? Where are we? Yeah, we are at the Margaret Herrick Library. We are in Beverly Hills. The library is in the former Beverly Hills Water Treatment Plant Number 1 that was built in 1927, fundraised by members of the Beverly Hills community, including Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, Harold Lloyd, and many others. And the reason for this building's existence was that Beverly Hills, in order for the city to not become incorporated into Los Angeles, needed its own clean water supply. And as you can imagine, Beverly Hills people did not want to be just with the masses of Los Angeles. So they built this building to have a clean water supply. Luckily for the Academy, some of the people that were fundraising for this building were some of the founding members of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. So when this library, which has been in existence since about 1927, 1928, from the very beginning of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, we had grown so large by the 70s and 80s that we just needed more space. So our former executive director was driving down La Cienega had been talking to a number of different places around Los Angeles, saw the building that had fallen into disrepair. By the 60s, they had other resources for clean water, so they no longer needed this building. There was graffiti all over it. It was not in the best of shape. So they made a deal with Beverly Hills, and we have been in this building since 1991. Oh, amazing. We are in the Carl Malden room? In the Carl Malden room, right outside of the Catherine Hepburn reading room. Oh my gosh, all the stars are here. And we're here to talk about what is in your life a major motion picture, <laughs> Ernst Lubitsch's slash George Cooker in a much smaller <laughs> font. One Hour With You, the comedy that is entirely about two things. One, how great it is to be in a loving marriage where you can freely have sex. And two, adultery. <laughs> So we got the two most important things in the Lubitsch world here. So I'd first love to hear about One Hour With You. I've never had anyone so enthusiastically lay claim to one of these episodes as quickly as you have. I think might have been the first sentence in the first email went back in our Berlin era. One Hour With You, please. (laughs) And I was like, sure, take it. (laughs) Tell me about this film. How does it speak to you? What's your relationship with it? My relationship to it is in the summer of 1987. I was living in Orange County. It was before I left for university in San Francisco. So I was at a place where I was just seeing as many movies as I could. So I was often driving up to LA to go to the New Art Theater or LACMA or UCLA. And UCLA had just restored One Hour With You. And there was a write-up on it in the LA Times. And it was on a double bill with Love Me Tonight. And I had never seen a Lubitsch film, but I had definitely read about Lubitsch. I knew about Ninochka, but I had not seen it at that time. So I was about 19 years old when... When I drove up one summer afternoon to go to UCLA to see it. And this restoration that UCLA did of One Hour With You added back these tinted sequences that kind of alternate throughout the film. There was something about the performances. There was something about the charming. Everyone was in on the joke. It was naughty. It was very fast moving. It was sparkling in the way that Lubitsch films are often sparkling, but it also had that paramount glimmer as well. And I was just captivated beyond belief. And 
it was one of those movie experiences that we've all had where you see a movie that I had no real expectations going in other than that I was looking forward to seeing it. And I just, I was truly like falling in love. I fell in love with this movie and it's a movie that does not get really talked about very much in the Lubitsch canon. It's a film that in a lot of the major filmographies and biographies of Lubitsch really gets very short shrift. Mm -hmm. It's kind of relegated to the side, even though it was nominated for Best Picture and it was a box office success during its release. But I have a very special fondness for it. I think that there's no other, of course, Lubitsch films all kind of connect to one another. They're all in the Lubitsch universe. But this film for me is a very epitome of what I think of when I think of Lubitsch. I mean, it's also like the horniest film that Lubitsch, I think, it's one ever of the horniest made. films ever made. Yes. It's up there with like Jewel Robbery, if you've seen that one. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's a few pre-code films, but this is just, maybe it might not be as horny as Jewel Robbery, but it's more about horniness. Yes. It's so single-minded. And at the same time, I think we can talk more about this later. There's gender inequality looking from a contemporary perspective, but I feel like when you watch the movie, the performer's are kind of playing to the audience that we all are in on the joke. Mm -hmm. And I also like to think of this movie in relationship to Jean Renoir's Rules of the Game, which is also similarly horny, similarly about people kind of reconnecting to have sex and otherwise, and that they're basically saying that there are rules in society, things that we can talk about, things that we can't talk about, yet we all know that everyone does it. And I think that this does it in such a light way. I think of it like when you think of a favorite piece of music and how it takes you back to that moment in your life. And I think that movie does that for me. I think it's very special. I had a certain idea of who Jeanette McDonald was. When I saw this, I think her performance is so exquisite and I can talk about this more, but I really became a fan of Marie Chevalier because of this film. Lubitsch, McDonald, and jean of Tobin has become one of my favorite secondary actors from 30s films as a result of this film as well. This film, Ani and I both first watched it in kind of almost like a week-long marathon where we went through just all the Marie Chevalier, Jenny McDonald, like extended universe <laughs> musicals where we watched Love Parade, this, Smiling Lieutenant, Love Me Tonight, Merry Widow, and eventually Monte Carlo, which kind of ended on a whimper. <laughs> but um, I blame Jack Buchanan. It's incredible how once you become acclimatized, because I hear this quite a bit of people saying, OK, you know, I saw one of these films and I feel like, you know, the reason maybe they're not talked about is that Maurice and Jeanette haven't aged as well as, say, I don't know, Greta Garbo and the Cary Grants of the world, the Carol Lombards of the world. And it almost feels like to me, though, that they're just so specific. Jeanette and Maurice, where Maurice, and you know, he was famously the only talking Frenchman in movies for a while, right? Before people like Charles Boyer came around and Jeanette. McDonald was the soprano. <laughs> what are those two screen presences? Like, what does Maurice bring? What does Jeanette bring? Well, I think in a way, it's not dissimilar when you think of Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. Mm. I think he's bringing sex to this. And I think Jeanette presents in a somewhat matronly, she brings a certain primness with her. And what I love about what Lubitsch does with Jeanette is that he kind of like literally and figuratively undresses her mm -hmm. for us. And what I love in Jeanette's performances in all of the Lubitsch films and Love Me Tonight as well, is that she's a willing accomplice to this. There are specific moments in One Hour With You where you can definitely tell she's in on the joke. It's not a joke at her expense. She's part of it. And I think in a way, they're also kind of taking some of the air out of her vocal mannerisms. I often say when I show this film to friends in the beginning of the film, when she sings her verse of what a little thing like a wedding ring can do, <laughs> when it goes into her moment and she like grabs that operetta kind of soprano singing voice, it's a little hard on her ears, I think, for a contemporary audience. But I think that Lubitsch also has a way of kind of, he knows it's a little bit over the top. It's not taking it as the grand dam of operetta. He's kind of nudging her in the ribs while she's doing it, which I kind of like. One thing I want to note in this film too is that she doesn't sing very much in this. She only sings, what, twice? She sings like an hour in and she sings the very opening number, but Marie sings in almost all the numbers of the film. She gets to sing in the title song as well. Yes, yeah, she does briefly, yes. yeah. I mean, if you were to like do a little screen count time of her singing, it's very low. Maurice dominates this movie. Without Musically, at least. And that's an interesting note because I like that you mentioned that Maurice brings the sex because he's also a very, very strange sex object. Very strange. I mean, I think also it's hard for modern audiences to kind of see him in the way that I think 30s audiences saw him and saw Jeanette mm -hmm. as well. 
I think. But I think if you can get on the radar, as I feel like I have a number of converts in my life that I've shown this to, they're also big fans. <laughs> and I kind of think that once you get to, oh, that Mitzi. Why did I kiss that Mitzi? I still can't feel it yet. And now I'm in a spot and what a spot. For right out there is Mitzi and right up there Colette. Should I be brave and misbehave or not? Should I say yes or no? Should I stay home or go? Why should I be afraid to fall? I'm only human. After all, I love Colette. I'm crazy for Colette. But oh, that Mitzi. If yeah. that song doesn't work for you, then you're never going to like Chevalier. Both times I watched that, that was my turning point of like, okay, especially the first time. I just remember oh, that going like, I can't believe this. <laughs> this it's is, kind of an earworm and it stays it with you. I would have used this as the opening clip for the episode. I already used it for the Mary Jail because of the Mitzi character in that. So I'll have to probably use like three times a day or something. But <laughs> That's good too. Funny enough, I was on a YouTube rabbit hole last night relating to One Hour With You. And I guess the title song is considered like a foxtrot. Mm. I think that the sequences where she sings, they kind of attune it to her vocal stylings. Yeah. But I think the rest of it is contemporary modern pop, I think, for the early 30s. What I would also venture to say is that I think of all of Lubitsch's musicals, I think that aside from Love Me Tonight, which obviously is not a Lubitsch film, this for me, I mean, we might argue about Merry Widow, but I feel like the songs in this film are so memorable. And I don't know if goofy is quite the right word, but I'm very charmed by the self-aware kind of goofy quality of it. There's just something very charming about the, I feel like pretty much every song is pretty memorable. Maybe the wedding ring song, maybe not my favorite, but it's establishing essentially that you have a husband and wife that are very happy and have conjugal relationship still. They yeah. go to great length for the first 10 minutes to show you that there's real love and that this is also a very active marriage. We don't have to hide in a secret rendezvous. In the best hotel, we could get a suite for two. But it's not a sin. And it's full of spice. But it's lawful. And it's awful and nice. What, what a little, little thing like a wedding ring, ring can do. I think even if the actual stylings and the musicmanship, regardless of whether one thinks that's memorable, the subject matter of the songs, I think we have to tackle because that is, I think, truly the memorable part for me. Where every single song in this film, I can't stress this enough for those of you who haven't listened to this film in the audience land, every single song in this film is either about how much fun you have having sex with someone or wanting to have sex with someone. Also, the aftermath of like, yes. well, yes, I guess I did have sex with that person. And I'm sorry, but wouldn't you do it too? Exactly. And come on, come at me. It was late and she was lonely And she begged for sympathy only Now I ask you, what would you do? <laughs> That's what I did too you know, he who among you has not cast the first stone, you know, yes. <laughs> go ahead. Right. I dare you cast a stone. This film, there's never been a musical that is so explicitly about sex. So consistently in all of cinematic history, I'm convinced. I'm with you on that. Yeah. And on one hand, I truly wonder how this get past the censors. And we kind of have to wonder no longer because Matt here was incredible in giving me the censors notes on this. Right. We have the production code records, the PCA files here at the Margaret Herrick Library, which is basically the correspondence between the writers and producers sending notes to the censorship office. And then they wrote letters back to them saying, we've gone over your script. You can't have the prostitute in the scene. You can't refer to an abortion. You can't, whatever the infraction is. And these notes for One Hour With You, which the first time I saw them was many years ago when I heard from someone that worked at the Criterion Collection that they were going to be putting this out on DVD. And of course, Matt, the mega super fan of One Hour With You, you got all of this extra notes because I imagined and I thought this is going to be the beloved <laughs> Criterion box set of 
my dreams of this film. It was, it was part of the Eclipse series that came out later on the Lubitsch musicals, which is lovely. But I was just basically feeding the Criterion people with all of this PCA <laughs> notes. So I'm thrilled that these notes can actually be of use to this podcast. And they're incredible. And not only for this film, but you've also supplied the notes for about six other movies that we have referenced at this point and will reference numerous times again, because some of them are incredible, especially, I mean, The Merry Widow, I have to single out. That film has such an interesting censorship history that we'll get to in what five episodes. <laughs> but in this case, you have some incredible little correspondence. Like this is one of the earlier letters kind of broaching the subject of, can we produce this film? One letter from the Hayes office, I suppose, signed Lamar Trotty, ends with, in other words, this film makes pretty light of adultery. It has the continental flavor and I fear will be dangerous. <laughs> But later on, the interesting twist here is that they explicitly say that in their own words, this is Jason S. Joy writing this, even so, if it appears in the finished picture that Mitzi and Chevalier have committed adultery and that fact is overlooked by his wife or treated as a casual incident, there will be grave questions of its suitability. Because the director and cast can handle risque scenes with tact and good taste, we feel that with this warning of possible danger, both as to the code and censorship, we should reserve opinion until we have the opportunity to see the finished picture. And that pretty much, I think, sums up the general tenor of the notes, where at least the early notes, the pre-1938 notes, like one other note from Fred W. Beetson. All of these seem to us quite risque, but having in mind that Chevalier will do them, we do not suggest any changes. <laughs> it seems that, I mean, explicitly here, it is written that because Ernst Lubitsch and Maurice Chevalier are responsible for this film, they are being given a free pass. It's also the pre-code, too. So I think Mary Widow had a much harder time. Got him right under the wire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, they were very lucky to have gotten that film made. But I think by 32, there was a little bit of like, we're going to look the other way. Yeah. You know, that Lubitsch is going to be classy. I think that class plays a big role in censorship as well, because everything is done at a certain level and elegance. I mean, American society is still like this today. You know, if you keep a certain elegance to you, we're going to overlook all this other stuff over here on the side. And I think definitely happening here with Lubitsch. The setting matters too, right? Because I mean, we could be anywhere. The film by no means has to be in France, yeah. but it is in Paris. And even just nominally in Paris, it allows the censors to go, this is a storyboard over there. Right. And it's Lubitsch's paramount Paris yeah. too. And I don't know if this is where we want to talk about this, but I mean, the production design, I mean, like all of the physical representations of this, you know, magical Paris land that is created on the Paramount sound stages is just, you know, exquisite. Let's go into that then. Yeah. We can be as meandering as we want. This is one of those enthusiast episodes where we can just <laughs> wax poetic about the film with no real form. And I'm very happy to have that. So tell me about the production design, because you've, in our conversations before this recording, have really done a great job, I think, of imparting to me your enthusiasm for it. But what specifically about the production design really gets your goat on this movie? Well, I think this movie, along with Lubitsch's film that he was making right around the same time, Trouble in Paradise, I think are probably maybe the two best representations of Art Deco production design mm -hmm. on film. And there's just something just very remarkable. I think Art Deco actually kind of goes out of style right after. I think by 33, Deco is not the popular style that it was at this moment in time. And Hans Dreyer, the production designer of this film, but also if you look at just in 1932, Hans Dreyer also was a production designer responsible for Love Me Tonight and also von Sternberg's Shanghai Express, which is uh, one of the most beautifully yes. designed yeah. films of the 30s, not to mention a couple years later when he does The Scarlet Empress, one of the most Baroque films ever made in Hollywood, especially in the 1930s. And I think Dreyer had kind of worked in some capacity on The Love Parade, but he was not the art director of that film. Mm. And I think if we're looking at this series of films that Lubitsch does with Chevalier and McDonald from this time, these early talkies, I think there's a progression in terms of the production design and the physical look of all of these films. Before us meeting today, I went back and looked at The Love Parade, went back and looked at Smiling Lieutenant, and you should all go see these movies because they're great. They're really entertaining. But I think from a physical production standpoint, each one of the films starts to look better than the one previous to it. And I feel for just my own personal aesthetic, I think that it kind of crystallizes in One Hour With You and Trouble in Paradise. Trouble in Paradise, maybe even more so because I think there are more sets in Trouble in Paradise, but between the two of them, I just 
think they're exquisite. There's nothing else like them. I mean, I think The Merry Widow also has, it's the Scarlet Empress of this group of films. I've been trying to get together a Merry Widow, Scarlet Empress double feature for a while because I think they're both really simpatico, like satires in different registers of Central Eastern European culture. And two films that were not appreciated at the time of their release, both Scarlet Empress and Merry Widow. I think Merry Widow did well, but because MGM put so much money into it, it didn't make the money back that they wanted on the film. It also got the version I was seeing at the time was significantly cut too because by the time it was released Hayes had had second thoughts and kind of cajoled Breen into requesting cuts so they had to cut the release prints hence why the version that we have now is uncut just kind of wow. funny wow but yes I did not know that I think part of what allows this film and Trouble in Paradise to embody this in a way that the witches other films at the time didn't necessarily is that they're two of his only films that are specifically set in the present tense, aside from something like To Be or Not To Be, where these films are, I'm always taken aback by One Hour With You in particular because it feels so modern. And I mean modern circa 1932, right. where it just feels, wow, this feels like a slightly more unadulterated than usual just depiction of 1932 bourgeois society. Right. It's just about a husband and a wife. It's not about royalty. It's not about this fantastic made up kingdom. No, this is Paris, France. This is about husband and wife going through marital problems. And done in a way, if you don't mind me adding to oh, what is a great description of this, I think the things that characterize, I think of them as a pair of Trouble in Paradise and One Hour with You. And I think the Lubitsch films that I think most cinephiles and most film critics kind of refer to, Ninochka, Shop Around the Corner, To Be or Not To Be, Trouble in Paradise is in there too, but I think those three later films tend to be the bulk of what people focus on with Lubitsch. And also, I think one of the things that is sometimes hard for audiences with Trouble in Paradise in particular, but I think it also covers One Hour With You, is that the characters are characters, but in air quotes. I think when you look at To Be or Not To Be, that's a real portrait, what feels like a real marriage of two actors. And this is like their life. It might be a very unusual life. It's incredibly heightened. But very heightened. Yeah. But their characters, like when you see Shop Around the Corner, those feel like characters that we all can relate to. These are people going through real issues of financial instability, workplace drama, etc. And yes, real marriage issues that most people that are married at some point encounter at some point. But because the plane is kind of so over the top, you're not so invested with the drama, which is, I also think, how Lubitsch gets away with it. I think, why did Lubitsch do that? Because he could, and he also gets away with it with the audience to go along with Chevalier having this fling and for his wife to kind of go along with it too. She's almost the cipher for the audience at that point who goes along with it as well. I think it's modern, but I also think it's modern in the way that a Family Guy episode is modern. (laughs) It's not taking itself too seriously. It's almost meta at that point. I mean, especially when the characters address the audience and they like performatively break. I mean, the last beat of the film I love because I never expect Jeanette and Maurice to turn to the camera suddenly and go, huh? Yes. There's this almost dichotomy though between the way the film, it might be to me unique among Lubitsch films in that it is just so hyper-focused on the ins and outs of a very delicate intimate romantic relationship versus like Design for Living, which is, it's a lot more epic in its scope where it takes place over years and they rearrange and even Trouble in Paradise, you know, there's these grand rearrangements. It feels fantastical. And One Hour With You is literally just about two days in the life of a married couple. Right. right? It's nothing grand ever happens. The film's climax is an off-screen affair and that's it. And there's no hook to it. There's no attempt to make it something more than it is. So that's part of why it feels so, like it just feels to me like if it weren't a musical, it would be a totally straight ahead almost chamber piece about a couple going through a rough patch. And I would also add to that, I think one of Lubitsch's great talents, we should also attribute Samson Rafelson to this as well, because I think Rafelson is also why this film, Trouble in Paradise and The Merry Widow are all so successful and The Smiling Lieutenant as well. Whatever the thing is that he draws out or brings out in Lubitsch, I feel like Rafelson was, for me, Lubitsch's best artistic partner in his career. Mm -hmm. And so I think he deserves some of those accolades as well. What Lubitsch does and his screenwriting partner, Samson Rafelson, brings to this is that you get a sense of the sex life or what the people around them are also doing. I think we should mention that this has one of the great early queer references. Oh, we got to talk about Adolf and his manservant. Yes, his manservant. So there's a sequence where Charlie Ruggles plays the friend who's also secretly lusting after Jeanette McDonald. He's like the lead 
least sexually intimidating suitor since like Edward Everett Harden. Yes, exactly. And he gets told that there's going to be a costume party that he's been invited to at Maurice and Jeanette's home. And so he gets dressed up in like a Romeo costume, Romeo costume. That's right. And when he finds out that it's not a costume party, his manservant comes in and he says, oh, sir, I so did want to see you in tights. Why did you tell me it was to be a costume party? Ah, monsieur, I did so want to see you in tights. And then you get a shock reaction shot from Charlie yeah. Ruggles, which is great. That's probably the most blatant, but I feel like you get a sense of these people behind. It's not as pronounced, but he's also kind of give you in little character descriptions of the secondary characters as well. That's one area where I think this film is a clear, I feel bad for not having mentioned this before, but this film is a remake of right. The Marriage Circle. And I think I didn't used to think this until my most recent viewing, but I think it's pretty much better in almost every way that matters. With the one exception of I dearly love Adolf Menjou. There's so much more shading given to just what everyone in this film, but especially like all the little side characters. The whole film feels populated, even though it's a really just a chamber piece with only four major players. Even Adolf is a bit of a tertiary character. But at this point, Lubitsch has such a faculty with just one little gesture. Like Adolf's manservant is an interesting character, despite the fact that he has one major line. You That's just right. can infer so much about him and even just the actor's performance who... Everyone is so well cast. Frames are so well constructed to give you like background interest for various characters. Let's talk about the marriage circle and how it compares because it's a little fascinating where the biggest change in the marriage circle, the doctor who in that case is Dr. Braun played by Montebleu. He does not have the affair, but his wife Charlotte believes he has. And her kind of dream of having this affair with the other man who it's not at all in this, it's Dr. Muller who some other dramatic rearrangements there. But the important part here is that Dr. Muller Mahler, they play that same charade with Dr. Braun, where, you know, the film ends with Charlotte and Dr. Braun egging him on so that he admits to this kind of stolen kiss in a way that Dr. Braun does not believe. In the marriage circle, the dramatic irony goes both ways. But in this case, Colette, who is Charlotte, is fully in the know on what's going on. She knows. So you have this interesting case where the doctor, in this case, Maurice, has had the affair, has come clean about it. He's forced to by the private investigator, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to synopsize the whole plot here. But that greatly rearranges the dramatics of the ending, right? Where instead of having this mutual dramatic irony, you have this honest, more like slightly more brutally honest ending where you have an affair that is just let go, right? Where I almost get the sense that Colette in One Hour With You almost figures out a way that she can let the marriage continue by kind of making something out of this dream she had and this kiss that was placed upon her without her consent, basically. And kind of going, okay, so her logic isn't my husband had an affair to hell with him or I got to bear it. My husband had an affair. How can I one-up him? <laughs> Which is an incredible way to resolve one's conflict. You also have some other smaller stuff. Like I do like how in the marriage circle, you start with the B couple. You start with the couple that isn't really as important, which is the Mitzi Adolf Menjou couple. And then in this, it's basically one couple story instead of an ensemble, which is what marriage circle is. But there's so many little things that they reflect very well on one hour with you. That's right. I agree with you. Am I wrong? At the end of marriage circle, doesn't Dr. Mueller go after Marie Provost at the end, who's driving yes. away in the car? There's a sense that nothing has Mueller happened, and Mitzi end up, but yeah. they kind of end up having a fling dot, 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 we assume at the end. And the fact that in the marriage circle, that film cares to tie up that loose end. That's right. Instead of just letting it hang, because all we care about in One Hour With You is the central couple. We want to see Maurice and Jeanette reunited at the end yeah, of it. Yeah, everyone else is a function of them, basically. Except maybe Mitzi, who is her own chaos agent in this. Yes, and so much fun to watch. What I would say about Marriage Circle, and I'm sure you've already covered this in your previous episode, but it's such a turning point, obviously. It's such an important film yeah. in the development of American romantic comedy. It's such an important development for Lubitsch as a film artist. And it has such a strong tie to Woman of Paris that I feel like it's historically so important. But I will say, while it's important, I don't think it's as good as One Hour With You. I think One Hour With You gives it a pizzazz that the original film really doesn't quite have. And I agree with you that I just think the performances in One Hour With You, the production design, the music score, you know, like a lot of great directors from Ozu to Hitchcock and Lubitsch remaking their own work and refining it as, you know, the technology changes or they themselves as artists change. I think it's wonderful. And it's wonderful to look at the two films together 
together and you see how, you know, a scarf becomes a bow tie yes, in the yeah. transition. And with Lubitsch, it's all about the objects. It's all about the cutting and the insert shots, which have meaning. It's the hat in Ninochka. It's the bow tie in One Hour With You. It's the card on the table. That I mean, that's one sequence that is almost identical in Marriage Circle is the dinner party Big sequence. dinner party, yeah. It's almost beat for beat the same thing. Yeah. What you get also One Hour With You is that dinner party now has the most gorgeous, opulent Art Deco dining room that's ever been put on film. And after dinner, you get this incredible dance sequence set to the song One Hour With You, which is an enormously popular song in the early mid thirties. And for me, it's just so freaking charming. Everyone's in on it. Genevieve Tobin, for a femme fatale, she has such a sense of her own drama and there's a slinkiness to her physicality as a character. I would also add that 1932 is this very liminal year in the development of the Hollywood musical. So Mm. 42nd Street had not come out yet. We had not codified what a musical was in American film. And so One Hour With You is this interesting, weird hybrid where there are elements of breaking the fourth wall where characters talk directly to the audience. There's a great scene early on where Mitzi and Colette meet at their house and their conversation, which takes place in three different locations in the house, are all rhyming couplets. Yeah, It's almost like a song, but not really. But it's incredibly charming. One good point of comparison is the character of Dr. Berthier, Maurice Chevier versus Dr. Braun, played by Monty Blue. It's such an interesting comparison in how the tension within the Berthier character is, I think, of a different tenor than Braun. Here's Braun as a character. He is fundamentally faithful to his wife and is basically trying to get this sex pest that is Mitzi off his back. And she kind of gets her revenge on him by, you know, concocting this affair. In this film, Bertier is kind of a questionably reformed rake. But here's the thing. He is also, in some ways, very faithful to Colette. But he also is very aware of the fact that he is a rake because he is Maurice Chevalier. He can't not be a rake. He's Maurice. You got That's it. right. So he is aware of his nature and he tries to resist the impulses. Basically, yeah, he tries to civilize himself. <laughs> He tries to do the Freud thing, right? Where it's like he has to let... Essentially, it's the return of the repressed. Exactly. And so Mitzi brings out his repressed animalistic urges successfully. That's the whole joy behind the song of like... Oh, that Mitzi. He has that line, which I love. Should I be brave and misbehave or not? Should I be brave enough to fall victim to my inner animal? (laughs) That's such an interesting conflict for a character. And the idea that their lizard brain can be at war with their kind of executive brain gives this film, I think, a heart that I don't... Again, Marriage Circle is just different. It's going for different things. I would also say that Marriage Circle, like a lot of dramas from the mid-20s, tends towards, I don't want to say easy melodrama, but I think melodrama was such a embedded into dramatic fiction that when Dr. Muller is having this kind of crisis of consciousness in terms of what's going on, I feel like it leads towards a certain kind of traditional dramatic focus. Whereas this, it's dealing with those dramatic tensions, but it's dealing with them in song. I love Colette. I'm crazy for Colette. But oh, that Mitzi. And to the value of that direct address too. the fact that Maurice can at any time and also Jeanette can look at us and tell us what they're feeling in no uncertain terms. And it's not even in, it's more direct than in most musicals we used to, right? You think of an MGM musical, rarely are they talking to the camera. They're usually expressing it to the audience outside the camera or to other characters, right? And this one, no, he's saying, you know, what would you do? I'll put this out there for any of those of you listening to this podcast. I can't recommend, you know, you think of 2001 A Space Odyssey or Eraserhead or Lawrence of Arabia as movies you actually need to see on a big screen. Strangely, I would put One Arrow with you right with those other movies because this movie works in a very specific way of watching those characters break the fourth wall and talk to the audience. Ladies. And gentlemen. If he were your husband. And she were your wife. And you find out he's a Don Juan. And you find out that she has dreams. And he confesses. And she admits. But you like him. And you love her. And you adore him. And you're crazy about her. What would you do? Every time I've ever seen it with an audience, it works so well. The response from the audience is extraordinary. And also the framing, it works differently than how it plays on home video. So just Mm. putting that out there. In my 
early years of one era with you euphoria that I was feeling and also feeling like I was the only person in the world that even knew what this movie was. So I felt like I was, you know, just kind of banging the drum myself, walking around telling people about this movie. In the mid nineties, I was living in San Francisco. I was selling vintage film posters at the store Cinemond. One of our clients at that time is David Packard and David Packard, and he gave money to UCLA to help restore this movie. And he owns the Stanford theater as well. And the Stanford theater regularly would play one hour with you along with love me tonight and other Lubitsch films, but one hour with you specifically, the very first time that I met David, I was helping him load posters into his car. We were actually on the floor of the gallery that I worked at. And I said, by the way, I'm so sorry that I couldn't come see one hour with you this past weekend. There was some conflict. And I said, but it may be my favorite American film. And then he turns to me, let me just put this out there. David Packard, lovely man, not the world's most social person, but he whipped his head around to me. He goes, that's your favorite film? It's mine too. Shall we start singing? And he immediately launched into... <laughs> I felt like we had a very strong bond as a result of that moment. Also, while I was in San Francisco selling vintage film posters, two men had come into the store looking for stuff. I don't know how One Hour With You came up, but knowing me, I probably inserted it into the conversation. And they looked at me and they said, well, you know, we're really good friends with Genevieve Tobin. I guess at the time they were going to see her in Carmel. And they said, you should come with us to meet her one of these days. For whatever reason, it never happened. Uh -huh. And it really just devastates me now thinking back of the things that I didn't do because Genevieve Tobin died in 1995. So probably within two years mm. of meeting those two guys in San Francisco. So anyway, you get a little bit more background of my history of this film, but also just my fandom, basically. One of the most rewarding things about the show is just so many of the episodes, I find out that it's the guest's favorite movie ever. So many of these films mean so much to either a lot of people or to a few very passionate people. And I think this is probably more the latter case, right? <laughs> Where it's, you get to be part of your own very exclusive club when your favorite film is One Hour With You. It's so true. It's <laughs> very, yeah, there's not a lot of other people on that same island with you. And just to kind of maybe circle back to Genevieve Tobin mm. for a second, ever since I saw this movie, I've become kind of fascinated by her. So if she's in any movie, I will watch watch any movie that she's in, I'm kind of astonished that she's kind of great in almost every movie. I mean, she has a very specific, distinct style. It doesn't change that dramatically. Probably mm. her most well-known film is the Betty Davis Bogart film, The Petrified Forest in 35, where she kind of plays, you know, one of the other characters stranded at this hotel. And it's a more dramatic role. But kind of looking across her career, I'm kind of surprised that more people don't know her name, like Una Merkel or others from that same era. I'm also kind of like, why didn't she get, I mean, I know the Supporting Actress Award was not invented yet at the Academy Awards when this film was released, but I think that's a fantastic comic performance. And I was, before coming on this show, I've been thinking for the last couple of days, because I figured it would come up, like, why is this movie better than Smiling Lieutenant? Or why do you like it more? More than The Merry Widow. Why? And this maybe help us segue into George Cukor. Yeah, this whole debacle. I think if I had to guess, and me as a gay man, and maybe why I'm responding to this film, I mean, I love all of the Lubitsch films, but this one in particular, I feel like there's a sense of camp to this film mm -hmm. that you don't really have. There's definitely camp in Merry Widow. Yes. Without well, a doubt. Yeah. But this, I mean, in the Mitzi character specifically, there is just a sense this woman has drama to spare. It's so hilarious and her comic timing is so great. When she yells at her maid for wanting to give her the night off, her response is so funny and so fast and so kind of mean. What are you doing tonight? Nothing, madame. Wouldn't you like to go out? No, madame, I'm too tired. Too tired? You can have the night off. I'm sorry, madame, but really I'm too tired. Other girls are grateful for a day off, and you, you're too tired. Oh, you're a most unreasonable girl and most ungrateful. Oh, oh be not. quiet. But funny at the same time that I love it. I also think that Travis Banton's costumes on her especially really mark that kind of campness, the big fur sleeves, different aspects of her costume are kind of extraordinary. And I wonder, I mean, the majority of this film was directed by Ernst Lubitsch, but I do sometimes wonder if there are elements of this that could have possibly been influenced or informed by 
Cukor himself. I'm not 100%. That's probably I'm projecting onto this, but I do think that there's something there. Even if you go back to Smiling Lieutenant, Claudette Colbert's character, who I love, I love that character, is very world weary. It's almost more like Unbearable Lightness of Being in that film, where Claudette's been around the block a few times. So she's feeling really deep feelings for Chevalier, but she also understands the rules of the game and helps Miriam Hopkins kind of blossom into the swan that she is. With this, there's not really any of that. There's not the seriousness and tone that exists underneath the characters in Smiling Lieutenant. This is everyone's just here to have fun. I think Mitzi is absolutely the kind of the epicenter of that because she's almost like a Groucho Marx type character in this where she seems to have no investment at all in any of the conflicts of the film. Her first decision in the film is taxi. Oh, this one's spoken for. Oh, oh too, too bad. bad. <laughs> she gets in anyways. <laughs> That's her entire character. She just takes what's hers, does not care about the consequences. And even when she suffers the consequences, this is oh, whatever, on to the next thing. And that is an integral part of camp. But the way that it's played in this film is so without judgment. Like the film weirdly reserves judgment on Mitzi. It just kind of takes her as that's the way she is. Deal with it, everyone. She's not a villain per se. She does things that in virtually any other film would be portrayed as villainous. But in this one, it's just that's just how she exists in this world and other characters have to deal with it. So true. And I would also say that in a way, her husband becomes the de facto villain in the film. Yeah, because he's the one who only person who has like executive function to be Machiavellian. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and there's a scene towards the end of the film where he's confronting Chevalier about this. And when he says, oh, I have no sense of humor, no sense of humor at all. There's this moment Pause. of quiet. The audience and Chevalier are just kind of hanging for a second. And then Roland Young emits this giant laugh as if the joke's on us. And that malevolence kind of stays with that character, even though Mitzi's the one really doing all the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. essentially. That's another good contrast to the marriage circle because Adolf Menju in that film, he's just tired. <laughs> he's just completely so tired with everything. It just wants out. And it's just totally bemused by it. There's not a Machiavellian bone in that character's body, it feels like, compared to this one. But yeah, no, it's, I was going to build off of the Mitzi thing briefly, but I totally lost my train of thought, which probably means it's a good idea to talk about George Cukor. Let's do it. Because this film has a highly unique production history as far as Lubitsch goes, because one piece of context that you, listener, have no way of knowing up to this point is that in two years, Lubitsch is going to become head of production at Paramount. And this film and Love Me Tonight are kind of early pre-echoes of that, where they're both in one way or the other, very different circumstances, but they're both kind of attempts to mass produce Lubitsch films, right? Where Love Me Tonight was directed by Ruben Mamoulian and The Marriage Circle was to be given to George Cukor. What happens is after two days of shooting, some of the cast and crew and also studio, some form of that. We know some of the cast didn't like this. Lubitsch is called to supervise production. And within four days, he's directing. <laughs> and Cukor is sidelined. He's present on the set for a week, but totally leaves production by November 20th of 1931. Cukor is off the production and onwards for the rest of the shoot. It's all the Lubitsch show. So the vast majority of the film was Lubitsch only. So how the hell did this happen? I have what a, a scandal. It's an absolute scandal. I think Cukor was bitter about this to the very end. I've read manuscripts that he has written. I do not think that this is a very terrible production. This is a big break for him as a young filmmaker. Mm-hmm. This is a game that I play. I'm acting like there's loads and loads of other people that are doing the same thing. But I often am kind of trying to squint to see what Cukor remains in the film. And I think that there is a couple moments because there's some things that are in this film that are in no other Lubitsch film. For me, I often think it's the opening scene with the policeman Mm. because there's nothing else quite like, I mean, it could be Lubitsch, but it's cut differently. It has an energy that's quite different. It might be also that it's a rhymed couplet sequence. I don't know. But the opening scene with the policemen who have to go raid the public parks, because during summertime or springtime, there are all these people making love in the park. And that's how we (laughs) open the movie. The big twist is... (gasps) This couple's married. That's right. That's my wife. And I have to say, I wonder if that was a scene that was one of the scenes that they reshot because it's that sequence of Chevalier and Jeanette with the policeman. I mean, it's beautifully acted. It's so funny. But then the sequence that follows it is Maurice and Jeanette go back to their home where they can make love at home because that's what a wedding ring can do. It's not a sin. It's, you know, allows them to enjoy each other. So... There's a scene where after Chevalier kind of introduces himself to the audience and says, shame on you for thinking that we weren't married. Ladies and gentlemen, I must talk to you. There is Colette and here am I. 
And I know what you think. Oh, I know. How dare you? You remember that policeman? He was wrong. And so are you. Believe it or not, we are married. I am her husband. And she is my wife. That's actually a moment that we know that Kuker did at least a version of. I don't know if that's a version in the film, but there's an anecdote in a couple of the books. That was a scene where Maurice bristled because he was asked to do some like what he thought was unnecessary business. Right. And I would say that well, I'm sure we've read some of the same materials on this. Didn't people report Lubitsch said that the scenes that Kuker shot with Chevalier, Chevalier was overacting them. Yeah. And so he got him to bring down his performance, which I think it's probably true because the comic timing of that first breaking of the fourth wall is perfect. Yeah, it's. I can't add to what you said. It's perfect. <laughs> and, and I will also say that Lubitsch is doing a very Lubitschian thing in this sequence where as Chevalier is kind of talking about his life with his wife, there is a strange little contraption on a little table to the side of him. And there are four photos that are on the rotation, almost like a lazy yeah. Susan that goes around. And so he describes his mother-in-law, but the photo is of like a, it looks like a lusty dancing woman basically. And he kind of points out these kind of non sequitur cut-ins basically to these photos, which are very funny. After that sequence, they go inside the bedroom where it's Jeanette and Maurice in bed together. For me, as much as I love this movie, I'm not blind to the things that are not perfect. One of them being at the end of this scene where they sing what a little thing like a wedding ring can do. It's a sequence where the two of them are trying to shut the light off as they go to bed. And Jeanette keeps turning it on, wanting to yeah. talk about her friend Mitzi. And it's cute, but the way that they end that that sequence is he turns off the light. There's a sound of something crashing as if he's somehow knocked her out or something. And then he says something like, it's a mitzi, 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 or something like that. And it's, it's funny, but I feel like it's almost too much. And I've often wondered if that was Cucor. I wonder, because I always interpreted that as like, he does something to break the mechanism that turns the light yes, off. Yes, exactly. Know? It's tough because I also think of like certain things in like the Smiling Lieutenant that I thought were like a little overcooked. Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, we know that Lubitsch wasn't averse to maybe occasionally breaking his continent alive. But yeah, it's, I guess, that question of authorship, right? Where it's how much of what we expect of an artist is just based on the information we have about them and the first like three things we saw. And then how can we use that to kind of, in the case of, you know, some ambiguity as to authorship, how can we use that as evidence to go, okay, this was this, this was that. And, right. you know, for example, I mean, you even think about the week long period where Lubitsch was supervising in big air quotes Kuker. Did Kuker have any influence in any? point like were there points at which like Kuker even on scenes that Lubitsch was basically directing had a say in and little gestures like that maybe there were moments where Kuker would come up with something and Lubitsch is like that's great you know we don't right we don't know they all die too young yeah it's yeah. so true I mean, I think the film stands alone. I don't think the film seems compromised as a result of that difficult production history, but I love Kukor, so like I feel badly that he had to go through this experience. Also, I often wonder if the idea that Kukor worked on this film has somehow left a stain on this film. Sometimes I feel like this film is seen as kind of the ugly stepsister in the Lubitsch canon of films because... And not Monte Carlo? Well, I think Monte Carlo, <laughs> yes. Monte Carlo of this group is definitely the low point of that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> the Jack Buchanan stepson. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I feel bad. I like Buchanan and other things. Yeah, but. and I think I think Monte Carlo, I mean, I still like Monte Carlo fine. It's not, it does have the most suggestive song ever about haircuts. That's true. But why fly another train? Barbers, pet, and yet get paid. You could make a sort of indoor sport of trimming the women. But ultimately, I think that the film survives all of that. I mean, it has its own unique tone mm -hmm. in Lubitsch's work. Definitely one for me that, I mean, on the first viewing, it was my least favorite of musicals until I saw Mark DiCarlo. <laughs> But yeah, once I kind of was able to go in expecting what the film was and not kind of, I saw it in between Love Parade and Merry Widow, which is the worst context to see any musical, in my opinion, because that's, it's two maximalist masterpieces. But with this film, it's its own really weird low key thing that's still incredibly body and frank. The film almost has like a Hannah and her sisters relationship to adultery. Yeah. Where in that film, Michael Caine's affair is portrayed as that film has like a winking skepticism of Michael Caine throughout. Yeah. But the film ends on a note of like Michael Caine going, okay, my marriage is stronger because of this affair. That's right. In this case, you have, I think, an even more interesting scenario, which is it feels like because of this 
twisted circumstance, their previously lusty marriage is going to get only lustier. That's right. Because of this affair. That's right. And that's (laughs) that's an interesting idea. Strangely, I have another Woody Allen related component to this, which is if you've seen the Woody Allen film Alice with Mia Farrow, I truly feel there is a variation on One Hour With You in Alice. There's a scene where she takes an herb that a Chinese doctor gives her to somehow change her personality so that she can be more of herself. And she meets a parent of one of her kids, another parent at the school that her kids go to. And right in the middle of just talking to him, he's a jazz musician. She has a moment where she's very prim, very kind of conservative woman. And then all of a sudden she looks at him and she says, your eyes are on fire. And then she kind of comes on to him at the school. Similarly, Jeanette McDonald has a number of these moments throughout One Hour With You. Also one of the reasons why I quite love her in this film. During the scene where she's kind of confronting Chevalier and she's kind of upset, she suddenly thinks about it, to your point, in terms of him getting away with it. And she goes, well, you think you're a Don Juan? Well, I'm a Cleopatra. Yeah. And what are your one hour with my 30 seconds? 24 24 minutes. minutes. Yeah. You think you were bad? No. You were just a naughty little boy. You think you're a Don Juan, eh? Well, if you're a Don Juan, then I'm a Cleopatra. You with your one hour. What's your one hour compared with my 25 minutes? That line, I would be shocked if anyone except Lupita wrote that line because he loves these turns of phrases where you think it's going in one direction, it goes the other. Yes. Right? Because you think she's going to literally one up him with a bigger number. Yeah. But no, she goes, my 24 minutes are better than your one. Uh, it's just such a, he can't help but overcomplicate the joke That's in a right. perfect way. And I would say, Dally, even going further back into the movie at the dinner sequence, my all-time favorite Jeanette moment in cinema is when they're at the table, she thinks that Chevalier has intention towards one of the other guests, not Mitzi. Oh, yes. And she's beside herself and kind of crestfallen. And meanwhile, Charlie Ruggles is doing everything he can (laughs) to get closer to her. And like, but he's also very timid. He's very Charlie Ruggles. She's now similarly to the end thinking to herself. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, she goes, let's be happy. She does a toast to him with champagne. Let's be happy. Let's Let's be be gay. gay. Let's have a good time. (laughs) (laughs) Immediately just turns on a dime from just anxiety to like, "Eh." let's be happy. Let's be gay. Come on, let's drink and be merry. Let's have a good time. And then he has his later line, which I love. Is it, when are we going to be gay? When are we going to dance? <laughs> oh, when are we going to be gay? She says, right now. And that's when they lead to the musical number. Yeah. I think that those moments of her sparking to life, I also think that it's predating screwball comedy at that time because she's suddenly out of character for what we know about Jeanette McDonald in this movie. And it's delightful to watch her in that way. It almost feels like Lubitsch, it was less like having her against type. And it just feels like she's so, Jeanette McDonald, I mean, is so good in those moments. It almost feels like, okay, Lubitsch was the only director that I know of, except, you know, Ruben. Mamoulian, who actually understood that maybe her true nature is as someone who's just vivacious and full of just this, in this case, erotic life, but just this lively presence when she wasn't necessarily allowed to be that. And I would say I agree with this narrative because I ascribe it to her as well. And I really love her from this period. But when she goes to MGM and she suddenly is in all these Nelson Eddy musicals, which really is what defined her and what defines her to, I mean, if there are audience members that know who she is nowadays, they think of her for those films, not for the Lubitsch films. And I wonder and think from what I understand from her own autobiography is that Mare had strong sexual intentions towards Jeanette. And I think they built those films for Jeanette, played into her own thought about who she was as a movie star. And I think as those movies go on and get increasingly baroque and more fanciful and more overstuffed in an MGM kind of way, I just think they're kind of lifeless. I mean, there's a charm to them, but you don't get any sense of her as the comic performer that she Mm -hmm. is in these Lubitsch films. Which is so interesting to me because her sound debut was The Love Parade. That's right. And she is the first hour of that movie is basically Horny Queen the movie. That's right. And I mean, the last half hour of the film, throw, <laughs> off the rails. But <laughs> the first hour, I love that to bits because the film is so unapologetic about her character's entire conflict, which is, I want a man who is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want one of these boring royals. And she gets Maurice. 
the final kind of comedic term rests upon an almost unequal dramatic irony, right? Where Maurice is essentially allowed to have an affair and she is kind of moved to one up him by claiming an affair that never really happened. And Maurice knows never happened, nor could it ever happen because it's Charlie Ruggles. Yes. Who among us could ever imagine an affair with Charlie Ruggles? <laughs> I don't think there's a single person on earth who could imagine. <laughs> I bet he was happily married. <laughs> probably carried on many affairs. What do you make of that kind of maybe supposed inequality? Well, I think it's a good topic to bring up because I think it's inescapable, especially as you talk about Lubitsch. I mean, I think, you know, those of us that love Lubitsch, I think in an era right now that we're in, there's a, you know, people might define it as political correctness. These are films that are definitely not politically correct. And I can see if you're looking at it strictly around gender lines, there's an inequality to this. But I would also say that there was a societal, and there still is a societal inequality. We're maybe a little bit better in some ways now. And I don't think you can point the finger entirely at Lubitsch. I think as a society, the audiences in 1932 would not be down for the heroine going out and having her own affair. I think it was, as you so beautifully stated earlier, that it's a portrait of modern times of this American society, wealthy society in 1932, that there is a continental approach to sexual infidelity to it that a modern audience might not be so easy. In fact, I think you look at some of the other Lubitsch biographies, there's a specific calling out of this film in those books, mm -hmm. which might be also one of the other reasons why they have a tougher time with this movie. But, you know, the same stuff is happening in To Be or Not To Be. Part of why To Be or Not To Be is so fascinating to me is that I can't think of another film from that era where you have the woman lead, played by Carol Lombard. She carries on an affair. It's not even an implication. <laughs> they screw in that bomber. <laughs> We know they screw that bummer. And the film never even motions towards any kind of judgment of her for it. In fact, the film basically cheers her on. And also knowing that there's going to be other suitors that are also going to be screwed later on. And that's the final climactic yeah. joke of the film. And the joke well. is entirely that the two men are being made fools of. And isn't that funny? Hooray for Carol. Yeah. And then, I mean, I can only think of like two counterpoints from 1932 or one from 33, but you have Design for a Living where uh, Miriam Hopkins carries on affairs with two men and it's portrayed as this three-way relationship, essentially. But I think Jewel Robbery is actually a good comparison here where that film mystifies me that it ever found any purchase anywhere because, and I'll loop around to why I think we shouldn't compare one hour with you to it, but Jewel Robbery is a film where the entire joke is that Kay Francis is this, you know, essentially kind of a trophy wife married to this older, rich aristocrat. And the central romance of the film is William Vowell comes in, he's a robber and seduces her and she is happy to carry on this affair with him. And the film ends with her running away with it. She never divorces her husband. She just, it's implied that she's going to go find William Powell, run away with him. And so you do have, in this case, a woman who is allowed and the film is unambiguously for the affair <laughs> that she carries on. But I do think that to just call out Jewel Robbery and Design for Living and To Be or Not To Be, those three films are partially famous because they're such, such the exception, right? right. If you've seen enough, even pre-code films, the majority of pre-code films are still very conservative by modern values 90 years later when it comes to, you know, the sexual autonomy of women in this case. And One Hour With You is, you know, we can look at it through modern eyes and go, oh, the way this dramatically plays out feels a little unfair to Jeanette. But if one looks at it through 19, essentially, what was the mean romantic comedy of 1932 all about. It reflects very well on this film, but I think that gets at the kind of the, there's no real right or wrong way to look at it, I guess. You can cross-reference with your own gut, with the expectations of modern society, the expectations of society 90 years ago. And there's certain films, you watch Birth of a Nation and you read about it and you go, okay, that film was extreme. <laughs> yeah. You know, even for 1914, that film was extreme on the side of history that we don't want to align with. <laughs> yes. Right? Right. The Searchers, to me, is the ultimate example of this, where yeah. The Searchers, from so many ways, is highly problematic now, but what it was doing in 1955 was kind of unprecedented. So this is a similar case where if we look at the specifics of what Jeanette's doing in that scene, or Colette, we're embodying the star system by calling them the star yes. names, which, you know, they're really, that's more accurate. What Colette does is that she essentially steals the agency from her husband. She goes, okay, you think you're bad? I'm going to do this. And regardless of whether it's true or not, I am going to make peace with this by reclaiming my own agency 
frenzy to essentially live something that never happened, which is pretty disarming. I think that really fascinating and you can problematize that, but at least it's of interest. <laughs> it is. What I would also say on the plus side for it in this is that unlike a lot of other movies that deal with romantic triangles or men having affairs, it never demonizes the wife. I mean, the wife is still the heroine. The wife is the mm. person that we, the audience, love and we love them as a couple together. This is a movie that is not generally interested in interior life. It's pretty much a movie on the surface with the exception of Maurice's songs that he's imparting to the audience. But we get a sense with Jeanette that she knows that her husband loves her and that their marriage is solid, even though there is this other thing that's there. And I think in one way, can we look at it from also a contemporary point of view in terms of people that have more elastic rules in their relationships and that, I mean, this maybe kind of pivots towards that you know, perspective on a relationship or a marriage as well. But, you know, it's up to each person how he or she or they are going to interpret or feel about this dynamic. Mm -hmm. But I would say that it's one of Lubitsch's strengths as a filmmaker that the movie is works as well as it does. And at the end, when she and Maurice address the audience, I've seen it so many times now, it lands. I think it's only after you see it, you kind of go, wait a second. He did a bit of a sleight of hand at the end. And from what I understand, when they first cut the movie, the movie had a different ending oh, with Chevalier yeah. himself addressing the audience. It works so much better when it's both of them yes, because it really feels like we're both in on the joke. What a lark we've had. We had some laughs by audience. Yes, exactly. If you don't mind me suggesting, since we're talking about that final sequence, I would also say if there is a directorial part, I think that is maybe the clunkiest aspect of this movie. There's about a few sequences towards the end where characters are essentially in a drawing room having conversations. Extremely long two shots. Yes, yeah. exactly. You're just looking at it just aesthetically as a film and not as just a fan of the film. I would say that I think the movie gets away with it because the performances are so great. But as an act of filmmaking, it's pretty static. Like the last couple of scenes are static, even though I think he nails the landing. Like, so by the end, it's a satisfying ending, satisfying conclusion. But I have to say, every time I see it in the theater, when we get to those scenes, I always find myself going, okay, now there's this section to get through. So there is a little bit of that. This dovetails perfectly into the talk about the tinted version, because I think the interest of the tinted version is largely structural for me, because what Matt has kindly done has alerted me to the presence of a version of this film that is not available on any home video currently in print, but has dye tinting in certain scenes. Notably, the nighttime interiors are tinted orange, nighttime exteriors are tinted blue. And this is fascinating because, I mean, one is, I can't think of another sound film from this era that has tinting. I truly am at a loss to understand whether this is something that was intended by the filmmakers or maybe this is a one-off like print that was made or maybe a series of prints because you have to tint the prints themselves. At this era, you could not duplicate tinting. Obviously, as I'm sure everyone listening to this mostly will know that tinting was very popular in the 20s and teens, mm -hmm. but with the introduction of a soundtrack on the celluloid that made tinting challenging and very rare for this time period. And my thought was, I wonder if this was made specially for New York and LA mm. presentations, like the really kind of high end, this would be the version at Radio City Music Hall or what have you. It's interesting too, because when films are like certain silent films were designed with tinting in mind. And so you can see some maybe evidence that this film wasn't necessarily designed for tinting. One example is there's a scene set an interior night. And so it's orange. And then we move to the exterior, but we can see the interior in the back of the shot. Suddenly, all those beautiful orange lights that reflect the colors that we expect that light to be are blue, despite the fact that the blue is moonlight. So if you watch any of Lubitsch's silent films, you can tell he's actually usually pretty good at avoiding that. He usually figures out ways to not have like a layer of tungsten light behind moonlight. But I think what this tinting does is actually reveal something about the movie structurally that plays into your observation about the last kind of act, because this film is interesting in that it has a very long third act. It has a relatively short first act and the second act takes us basically till the end of the big party slash affair sequence, right? Which is the centerpiece of the movie. But in the tinted version, the party and affair sequence is the longest stretch of tinted elements in the film. So you go from the beginning, which is monochrome, 
And then you have a bit of, you know, tungsten, a bit of blue tinting, but then a very long stretch of orange and blue tinting, which again, to me, imparts a sort of emotionality on the images. There's a color rhythm there where if I see something tinted bright orange, there's an intensity to that. So you get this, you know, literal intensity that accompanies this loaded party scene and this affair. And then suddenly you wake up, it's the morning after all the colors rained out for the rest of the film. And suddenly the film is this much more static drawing room comedy with, for the first time, some actual dramatic stakes. I think that what the tinting does really is it emphasizes a certain structural strategy that's already there. I'm not sure whether it improves the film. I'm kind of tempted to take the Blu-ray and then take that into DaVinci Resolve and tint it myself to match up with that version so I can kind of see it with high quality and with tinting. Oh, please do. You have to invite me over for that. Oh, yes, I will do. <laughs> I'm very tempted to do that, but it's such an interesting version with that in mind. And I, you know, I'm pretty sure it, it fully doesn't exist online. I mean, it is not in the ether and in, in the gray market. If anyone listening ever has access to it, check it out because it's a good type of tinting that emphasizes what's there already and adds to the color rhythm of the film in, I think, a meaningful way. Really beautifully stated. And I would also say for the audience, if any of you listening has access to a laser disc player, the color tinted version was part part of a Lubitsch box set put out, I think around 94, 95 that you can still find on eBay in advance of this episode of recording this episode. I asked a colleague of mine if they could make a transfer from Laserdisc to scan and realized that the film is on two different discs and the the box set that I had, I must have left the second oh no. disc in my old laser player, which is now long gone. And so I had to rebuy the box set on eBay and it was only like $30. So just putting that out there, if any of you are interested in seeing that, because there are a number of them for sale currently on eBay. It joins the student prints in Old Heidelberg. It's a film where if you want to see the most interesting version, you got to hunt down Laserdisc. <laughs> the last thing I'll mention is that you gave me a piece by Harold Meyerson on One Hour with you right before we recorded. And obviously that's for a reason. When I was younger and I was like, kind of hungry for other reviews and other things that were written about this film. So this essay appeared in one of the volumes of the McGill's Survey of Cinema books, a number of books that, you know, cover basically essays on many key silent films, many key American films. And these were popular in libraries probably in the 70s, 80s, and maybe early 90s. Anyway, I think this essay is quite good. I also like it because this guy clearly loves this movie as well. He also starts comparing this film with Trouble in Paradise. And so this is at the end of his essay, Meyerson writes, almost since its release, One Hour With You has languished in the shadow of Lubitsch's next film, Trouble in Paradise, generally regarded as his greatest talkie. In <laughs> fact, either film is a worthy claimant to the title. They are Lubitsch's first two solo collaborations with his favorite screenwriter, Samson Rafelson, and the freshness and good feeling of the partnership enlivens both scripts. Each film boasts unnaturally perfect, almost hermetic sets by Hans Dreyer and razor sharp cinematography by Victor Milner. What may tip the scales ever so slightly in favor of One Hour With You is Marie Chevalier, who offers his greatest performance. No other Chevalier film so exploits his unmatched ability to establish an intimacy or perhaps complicity with the spectator. One reason for the unjust relegation of One Hour With You to obscurity is the fact that for years, it was thought to have been directed by George Cukor from Lubitsch's plan. In fact, Cukor worked as director for only two weeks, as he himself has told Gavin Lambert in the book on Cukor, and during that time, he followed Lubitsch's design religiously. With all this ambiguity over the directorial credit and the film's relative inaccessibility have diminished the picture's reputation. The time has come for its upward reevaluation. One Hour With You is another Lubitsch masterpiece. Ah, uh, that gets at a common theme among all the kind of underexplored films of this show, which is that so much of canon formation is not disinterested. Which film was actually better? It's which film was released on home video in a watchable version 20 years before the others, right? That's right. That's Trouble in Paradise. Yeah. You know, Trouble in Paradise has been more accessible. You have a film like, I mean, I think an incredible film like The Doll, which was not properly released anywhere right. when it came out and is now relegated to obscurity relative to almost all of his American works, despite the fact that I think it's up there with most of them. Yep. 
The Merry Widow, I think, is similar, where because of its, it was like the last drink at the bar of Precode. And because of the drama that accompanied its release with the censors and the inability to see it later, it was essentially forgotten, despite, I think, being one of the greatest musicals ever. So this is yet another <laughs> film that is, if not but for the chance or whatever, anyways. Um, I'm losing my words. If but for the grace of God or whatever. Yes, yes. Yes. Same. This might have been a canonical masterpiece, if yes. not for just the fact that Trouble in Paradise is 10% more accessible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. I mean, the good news is, is that for your podcast, I mean, you're shedding light on all of these films. And, you know, my hope and, you know, even the excitement of being able to share my enthusiasm for this film, it's so lovely to kind of have that. And what I really hope is that more people see this film. Just thank you for the opportunity to of course. come back on. And thank you. This is so much fun and you are such a great host. So thank you. And likewise, thank you so much for hosting our, this has been our second of three recordings today, hosted at the beautiful Mark and Herrick Library. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely lovely. And I would say to all the listeners and you as well, have a great day. I guess that's the end of our recording. Thank you. Next week, Leah Jacobs joins us to discuss Ruben McMullian's Love Me Tonight as well as film rhythm in early sound cinema. Head over to ErnstCast.com for information as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing this season and other resources such as show notes and our Discord server. How Would Lubitsch Do It is a production of Moving Image Agency. Griffin Scheel was our dialogue editor for this episode. Anna Shadek scott was our recording engineer. Recording facilities provided by the Margaret Herrick Library in Beverly Hills. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on whatever podcast platform you happen to use. It helps other people find our podcast and therefore find Ernst Lubitsch. We'd like to acknowledge that this podcast was produced on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. 